Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of November 29th. Uh, I hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving. And today we'll be hearing from uh, Michelle Degree, our Health Policy Project Director here at the Care Board, and Lindsay Kill, our Data Analytics and Information Chief, and a number of other folks from uh, Diva, Blue Cross, MVP, and OneCare for uh, a series of presentations on OneCare, sorry, on the ACO results uh, payer panel. Uh, first, I'll turn it to Susan Barrett, our Executive Director, for her report. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to remind folks that there are several ongoing um, special public comment periods. If you go to our website under public comment, it will um, take you to that site. We have uh, several ACOs that the board is currently reviewing. And in addition, we are looking at um, the health information exchange strategic plan and connectivity criteria. So um, we're accepting public comments on that process as well. And then um, two uh, ongoing projects. The first uh, is the community engagement as part of Act 167. We just wrapped up uh, earlier this, right before Thanksgiving, um, the community engagement meetings, um, but we are continuing to accept public comments. So please, please hop on the website, learn more about that project as well as um, provide any more of your comments. And then uh, lastly, we are accepting public comments on a next potential model that um, Vermont would enter into with uh, CMMI. Uh, HS is leading that work. So we're sharing any of the comments with them and encourage folks to share their thoughts on the website on that issue as well. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and we have the meeting minutes from November 20th. Um, although, is there a motion to approve the minutes from November 20th? So moved. Second. Second. And all those in favor of approving the minutes from November 20th, say aye. 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 Uh, and the minutes are unanimously approved. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Degree and Ms. Kill, to um, introduce the panel and to take over the presentation. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Yes. All right, let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so as uh, Chair Foster mentioned, I'm Michelle Degree. I'm a Health Policy Project Director here at the board. Um, this is the fifth time I'll be walking the board through this presentation, so I think only um, Robin and Jess have the pleasure of having done this with me that many times. Um, and as uh, Chair Foster mentioned, we've got a bunch of folks from um, various agencies who have contracts with the ACO or had in 2022 a contract with the ACO um, to discuss quality and financial performance from that year. Um, I know this is uh, a time where um, it gets a little confusing. We're talking about 2022 today while we are in the middle of reviewing um, and presenting on OneCare's proposed 2024 budget. So definitely a little behind. I just want to acknowledge that um, and that we're talking about sort of different performance years here. Um, so let me move ahead. Um, I'm going to do a really quick background uh, and then we'll go through the results. I'll have everyone introduce themselves as their slides come up. Um, just let me know when to advance. We've combined them all into one deck for ease here and then we'll go into uh, board questions and public comments. So uh, just a reminder that today's discussion is under the board's ACO oversight, oversight authority. Um, and you know, under the model agreement, an ACO is a legal organization of healthcare providers that agrees to be accountable for quality, cost, and overall care of the beneficiaries assigned to it. Uh, the ACO's scale target programs must reasonably align in their designs across payers, which includes these ACO payer contracts that we're gonna talk about today. Um, and the quality measures that are within them. And these measures, while related, are just 
distinct and separate from the performance under the all payer model quality reporting results, um, of which we currently have uh, through 2021 with 2022 anticipated um, probably in the second quarter of 2024. It takes about 18 months for those reports to come out. So now I'm trying to do math in my head. It's a dangerous game. Uh, so a quick reminder here, we've got the a, a crosswalk here to just sort of show you where um, all of these kind of intermingle and where we might see some uh, some sort of cross pollination. Um, we've got all of the all pair model measures listed here. And while there is overlap through the payer programs, um, any differences that remain are typically due to types of populations covered, right? So in the Medicaid space, we're talking about children and adolescents, you're probably not going to see a, a similar measure for the Medicare population. Uh, with that, Lindsay and I will go into, um, if you imagine me having a separate hat, putting on a CMMI hat and presenting on behalf of Medicare. Um, so I believe we're going to start with Lindsay. Um, if you want to go ahead, I'll advance to the next slide. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lindsay Kill, and I'm on the data and analytics team here with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, just to reiterate, we I'm about to talk about um, One Care Vermont's Medicare participation and Medicare financial settlement. Um, so what this chart here is showing is year over year in the model, our prospectively aligned Medicare ACO beneficiaries at the start of the year, and then those who are ultimately included in settlement. These are two different populations because uh, the program limits which beneficiaries can be included for the financial settlement. Those beneficiaries must maintain eligibility for the entire performance year or in the case where individuals pass away in that year, they need to remain a me Medicare beneficiary until they pass away um, or they receive 50% or more of their primary care services in the ACO service area. And what you're seeing here in this chart where the difference between prospectively aligned at the beginning of each year and those included for settlement by the end of the year, that difference is growing over time. And that is because in Vermont, over the course of this model, we've seen um, a substantial uptake in Medicare Advantage enrollment. And that is one of the criteria for being included in settlement is that you are, are not a Medicare Advantage um, beneficiary. So that's where that difference is coming over time. Um, next slide, please. On this slide, we have a snapshot of what is uh, already posted on the website. It is the 2022 financial settlement um, spreadsheet. We also call it the shared savings and losses. And the way to look at this is the top down across the two columns for our Medicare population, um, the traditional, traditional Medicare population, age and disabled is in um, the first column and ESRD is in that second. And then we have the totals and then blended totals um, in the rightmost column. And starting at the top, you work your way down to look at first that prospective benchmark and then the updated benchmark, those totals. And then we can see our aligned beneficiaries, that total number being 45,972 for Medicare and their total person months. And that has given us a blended um, PBPM of 848 for 2022. Um, under that, we see what was actually spent on behalf of those beneficiaries. And we break that out into the claims spend, which is that um, more traditional uh, fee-for-service spend. And then we have the AIPBP fee reductions. And AIPBP stands for the All-Inclusive Population-Based Payments. We subtract 
the adjustments that had to be made in 2022, um, which were uh, inclusive of uncompensated care, a new um, a program change for 340B, COVID expenditures and sequestration to get our total spend. And from there, we calculate things like the quality adjustment, the gross shared savings and losses, and net, which I'm going to go through on uh, in two slides from now. Um, so next slide, please, Shell. So this slide is just showing um, sort of the top of the line spend for all of those beneficiaries in um, in each year. And you can see how for um, in 2022, the AIPBP to fee-for-service spend ratio was pretty similar to 2021, but overall through the course of the model, we are seeing um, proportionally growth in the AIPBP investment versus fee-for-service. So um, that's a good thing, I think. <laughs> Next slide, please. And then um, this is kind of the meat and potatoes, that bottom half of the settlement um, spreadsheet, which again lives on our website. Um, for 2022, we have gross savings and losses of um, 20.3 million. There's a cap on those savings and losses, um, and that is 9.5, um, and they have the with the, what the cap is, and then the ACO has the max of that. So they got all of it, 9.5. The quality adjustment is the big difference this year. Um, and that, uh, I, I don't want to steal Michelle's thunder. She's the quality person, so I'll let her talk about that. But the, the total adjustment numerically is um, subtracting that 786300 786 thousand three hundred and two dollars in 2022 the ACO's risk arrangement was 100 percent and so that adjusted capped savings and losses subtracting for quality and subtracting sequestration is this 9.5 and then we always subtract the advanced shared savings and that gives us the net settlement adjustment um, for 2022, which is this $490,346. And I think after that is a discussion of quality. It is. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so as Lindsay just mentioned, there was an overall reduction based on one care's quality performance in the Medicare uh, program this year. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, um, but I wanted to just do a quick overview of the Medicare quality performance and how it's broken out. It's in four domains. Uh, you can see them on the screen here. And for the 2022 performance year, it was a mix of pay for performance and pay for reporting. And we'll talk about that a little bit here. So past Medicare performance um, has kind of, we've gone through a little bit of an ebb and flow, some of it due to the public health emergency. Um, performance year one was 100% score earned just based on the first year of the program in operation. Um, 2019, we had a, a, another mix of paper performance and paper reporting. Um, for 2019 and 2022, the areas where it's pay for reporting only are areas where Medicare does not have a comparable benchmark to compare one care to. So automatically they would earn sort of the, the full points for those uh, measures. So as you can see, uh, performance has declined in performance year five here for 2022, and we'll dig into that a little deeper. Um, so the CAPS results are the area in which One Care's performance declined the most significantly and had the greatest impact on their overall score. Um, you can see that here. Um, the, the biggest areas that we um, saw a decrease in were um, health promotion. Um, sorry, I'm getting to my notes. Um, health promotion and education, which had a 3.5% decrease. Um, we had um, 
uh, stewardship of patient resources, that was almost a 9% decrease. And then the care coordination was about 4.5% decrease. And again, those had the largest impact on their overall quality score. Um, a couple of things to note here. If you recall, last year we talked about um, a change in how the CAP surveys were administered. Um, OneCare opted to get rid of or to no longer contract for phone calls um, in the CAP survey. So these are paper survey based only. That was a change in the 2021 performance year. Um, and as another reminder, CAP surveys were not administered in 2020 as a result of the public health emergency. So no CAPS results for 2020 if you go back in time. Um, just wanted to, to flag that. Um, I did poll 2021 performance here so you can see the changes. Um, I will also add that in 2021, after a pause <laughs> during the public health emergency, uh, CAPS benchmarks were switched from a purely decile based performance. So 10% was 10th percentile, 90% 90th percentile to actual performance based benchmarks. Um, so in some cases, you'll see those percentiles, you know, I think in, in some instances, the, the 90th percentile might be, um, you know, 84.5 to 86%. They're much smaller ranges to, to meet some of those percentiles um, starting in 2021. Uh, here are some of the clinical and uh, claims-based measure results. Um, clinical quality um, continues to use decile-based benchmarks across the board. Um, you'll see that there are noted decreases here. Uh, most of them are quite modest. We didn't see as large of impacts on quality score in this arena as compared to the CAPS uh, survey results. Um, there were also significant changes to the VT1 and VT2 that's just what CMMI calls them because they're not typical Medicare uh, measures. So the follow-up after discharge from the ED for mental health or alcohol or other drug dependence, and then the initiation and engagement measure. Um, there were significant changes there um, to specifications. So I did not pull over the 2021 performance. And as I noted earlier, it's not a typical Medicare uh, measure. So there are no performance benchmarks there. I really wanted to highlight some considerations uh, through the sort of three areas that we just looked through. Um, first, again, performance on CAPS had the largest impact on SCORE. I talked about the measures with the largest decrease and I, I do have the CAPS survey handy. So if any board members wanna quiz me on measures that are included in those, I, I do happen to have them. Um, in clinical quality, all of those measures were pay for performance in 2022, um, and performance on those, again, did decrease across the board, but those changes were modest. There was an addition of several codes um, that resulted in some denominator changes, which means, you know, not really comparable to prior years anymore. So again, on the previous slide, I did not pull forward 2021 performance. So I'd be really careful about making sure that we're um, only making comparisons where that makes sense to do. Um, and then for the claim space measures, again, paper reporting because there are no performance benchmarks. So I tried to call out all of the the really key points um, for Medicare performance on, on those slides. I am going to pause uh, to ask Chair Foster how you want to proceed. We can go through all payers and then have Q&A at the end, or we can do it individually after each um, payer speaks. Do you have a preference? Um, I, I don't, unless you do. We typically go right through, but it's, it's up to you. That's totally fine with me. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, then with that, um, I'm going to be joined by Amy and I believe Alicia from Diva. Uh, and Amy and Alicia, just let me know when you want me to advance slides for you. Hi, thank you, Michelle. Um, for the record, hi, I'm Amy Coonrod. I'm the Director of Operations for Accountable Care Organization Programs at the Department of Vermont Health Access. And I'm also joined by Alicia Cooper, who is the Director of Operations for Managed Care Programs at the Department of Vermont Health Access as well. Um, and I, we are here to talk about the VMNG Program's 2022 performance. 
next slide, Michelle, thank you for driving, by the way. Um, just for a little bit of framing, and I think this slide looks familiar to a lot of folks, um, the VMNG program is reinforced by DIVA's priorities. Um, DIVA has three priority areas that the department focuses on and has been focusing on for, I think, the last seven years at this point. We're nothing if not consistent. And two of them pertain to the VMNG program. Um, one of them is related to value-based payments, and this is a pretty great example of a value-based payment model. Um, and one is related to performance. By implementing the VMNG program, we are able to focus on Medicaid being a predictable and reliable payer partner. And we're also able to focus on continual and incremental programmatic improvements as we make changes year over year to the VMNG program. <clears throat> also, the program gives DIVA opportunities to align Medicaid with other similar payer programs in the state. And it also allows DIVA to be an innovative leader and test new ideas that other payer programs may want to align with in future. Um, one of those at this juncture is exploring new payment models related to the recently announced AHEAD model, but I will get to that in future slides. Next slide, please. As a refresher on where we are and how we got here. Um, the original VMNG contract was signed way back in 2017, and it was a one-year agreement with four optional one-year extensions. DIVA and OneCare Vermont triggered one-year extensions for each of those years, so 2018, 19, 20, and 21. And then also in 2021, DIVA issued an RFP to continue contracting for ACO services for a 2022 performance year. And one care was the successful bidder um, during that RFP process. After that, Diva and One Care negotiated a subsequent one-year contract with the possibility of three one-year extensions with a start date of January 1st, 2022. And uh, Diva and One Care are currently negotiating the second of those one-year extensions for a 2024 performance year. The PMPM -PM rates that are associated with the program are. Um, renegotiated annually <clears throat> due to changes in the attributed cohort annually, typically. And um, reconciliation for the program currently occurs annually, but it could occur more frequently during the performance year um, should we identify a need to do that. Next slide. And yes, now we will dive into the 2022 specific performance for the program. Um, this slide just shows, I think, the changing scope of the program year over year. Um, it's stable, and it continues to be stable in terms of its size and scope, um, as shown in this table here. Um, as we can see, the program grew in the first four years of its existence in 2017 through 2020, um, and it leveled off in the 2021, 22, and 23 performance years, both in terms of the number of HSAs, health service areas participating, um, the number of Medicaid members um, attributed, and the number of unique Medicaid providers who are participating in the program. Um, this combined with the use of an expanded attribution methodology beginning in 2020 um, and continuing until today, um, indicates the program has potentially reached scale for Medicaid and may not see much more significant growth in future performance years. As a reminder about that expanded attribution methodology, we implemented that in 2020 um, such that we would attribute Medicaid members to the program both if they have a demonstrated relationship with a primary care provider, which we call our traditional attribution cohort, um, and if they don't necessarily have a primary care provider, but they have a full Medicaid benefits package, which is our expanded attribution cohort. Um, the program still continues to exclude members who have a primary care provider who's not participating in one care. Um, I'll note that late breaking um, attribution was recently set for the 2024 performance year, and the program is seeing fewer members attributed through Medicaid, as you can see in that 18% decrease there. Um, that likely has to do with the redetermination activity that's picked up at DIVA since the end of the public health emergency, which has resulted in the disenrollment of a number of Medicaid members who no longer meet eligibility criteria. Um, because OneCare's provider network has remained stable between 23 and 24, we think that decrease is likely due to redetermination activity. And next slide, please. 
because it's a fun, colorful one. Um, just to quickly review the details of the payment model that we have in the VMNG program. Um, one primary characteristic of the payment arrangement that we have with OneCare is that um, we negotiate an agreed upon price for the attributed members for each VMNG contract year. Uh, this is illustrated in the green bar to the left, uh, which is 100% of the total cost of care or the agreed upon price. Additionally, the arrangement includes a risk corridor, which is illustrated by the, the dotted lines that are red and green in there, um, whereby if one care spends between 100 and 102% of the agreed upon price or the space between that blue and red dotted line, uh, they're liable to pay that money back to Diva. But if they spend above 102%, they're only liable up to that first 2%. Conversely, if one care spends less than the agreed upon price or the area between the green and blue dotted lines, um, they and their provider network are entitled to retain the difference between actual performance and the full 100% of the agreed upon price for the first 2% of underspend, um, which creates an incentive to be efficient with resources within the risk corridor as outlined here. And next slide, please. And then in terms of financial performance for the 2022 performance year, Diva and OneCare agreed on the price of healthcare for attributed Medicaid members up front and spending for ACO attributed members was approximately $12.1 million less than expected, which is the expected total cost of care of $285 million for the traditional attribution cohort and around $3.7 million less than expected on an expected total cost of care of approximately $45 million for the expanded attribution cohort. Um, because the expanded cohort is still relatively new to one care, the traditional and expanded attribution cohorts had distinct risk arrangements and were reconciled separately in 22. Though I will note that um, those have since been combined into one cohort for the purposes of reconciliation, and they have one risk corridor for 23 and 24, but we're not there yet. I'll talk about that next year. Um, and uh, after applying some necessary adjustments, um, DIVA will issue OneCare a reconciliation payment of approximately $11.8 million, um, and that includes <clears throat> The money within the risk corridor. And I don't have more detailed numbers on this slide to share about the whole financial reconciliation and how it shook out, but we would be happy to share that detail as well. It just gets very busy on a slide, so I didn't paste that here. Next slide, thank you. And here is just another way of depicting <clears throat> Graphically, the ACO's financial performance for both attribution cohorts for the 2022 performance year. We do love our stacked bar charts in this model. Um, the expected total cost of care is the total of all of the components of the bar graph, with the yellow portion being the prospective payment that is issued to OneCare monthly for its attributed membership from DIVA. And the orange portion is the fee-for-service portion that DIVA retains and issues to providers on OneCare's behalf for those providers who may not be ready to be paid prospectively or providers who are outside of OneCare's network, such as out-of-state institutions that have a relationship with Vermont Medicaid. Um, and the gray part of the bar is the difference between what was spent and the agreed upon price or the expected total cost of care. Um, and in this situation, in this performance here is owed from DIVA to OneCare. And so on the left, we see the traditional attribution cohort. And on the right, we see the expanded attribution cohort. And next slide. Ah, and here is that same graphic depiction of the expected total cost of care broken down by the prospective payment portion, the fee for service portion, and how actual performance shook out with the risk corridors for all years of the program to date. It is getting busy on that slide. Um, I think this is just a great depiction of of the how <clears throat> the um, expected total cost of care broke down between the fixed prospective payment portion and the fee for service portion for all of the years. I think this is pretty similar to the, the slide that Lindsay spoke to um, on the Medicare portion of the presentation, but we, we generally see that the, the fixed prospective payment component of the expected total cost of care is a little over half um, for each of the performance years here. Um, and I think that that's that's good to note. And then also, this slide shows that there have been years where um, OneCare was entitled to a payment from DIVA because they spent less than the agreed upon price. 
specifically in uh, 2017, 2020, 2021, and 2022. Um, and there are years here where the uh, one care was liable to pay Ziva back um, for an amount in excess of the agreed upon price, which I believe were 2018 and 2019, yes. Next slide. And now we will run through the VMNG program's quality performance for the 2022 performance year. Um, as a reminder, this measure set for 22 contained 10 payment measures and three reporting measures, including the CAPS survey. Um, as a reminder, um, the VMNG program reverted back to pay for performance in 2022 um, after being pay for reporting due to COVID in um, previous performance years. So just to note that um, one cares providers earned a total of 13 out of 20 possible points in 2022 for quality performance yielding a quality score of 65%. Um, this quality performance exceeded the national 90th percentile for three of the measures in the quality measure set, exceeded the 75th percentile for two measures in the set, exceeded the 50th percentile for three measures, um, exceeded the 25th percentile for one measure, and was below the 25th percentile for one measure as well. Um, and then also based on quality performance, the year-end quality adjustment for to the expected total cost of care for 2022 was um, are just shy of a million dollars. Next slide, please. And this slide just gets harder and harder to read every year. And I apologize for that. Um, so this is just the actual quality scorecard for the 2022 VMNG quality performance. Um, the, the measure set has not changed very much since 2017 and 2018. The measure set's been pretty consistent, so I won't go through and read all of the measures here, but you can see both how the traditional cohort did on these measures, how the expanded cohort did on these measures, um, the benchmarks, against which they were measured and their 2021 performance. Excuse me. <clears throat> and you can also see in a color coded way how they fell into the different percentiles that they fell into when they were scored um, against these measures. I'll note just really quickly that the um, traditional cohort was pay for performance um, on all measures and the expanded cohort was pay for reporting. Um, we're reporting only on the claims-based measures, and we don't have rates for the expanded attribution cohort for the clinical measures due, due to the, the way that they're attributed and that um, it would be difficult to um, do chart abstraction for samples for those clinical measures for the expanded attribution cohort. Um, I'll, I'll generally say here that there were some noticeable improvements excuse me, for the 30-day follow-up after discharge from the ED for alcohol and other drug abuse or dependence treatment, and that was significant, as well as um, a significant improvement in diabetes core control. And there was also a statistically significant decrease in the engagement component of um, initiation and engagement of alcohol and other drug abuse or dependence treatment. That is a mouthful. And I will let folks squint at that at their leisure, um, but I will move us to the next slide. Um, and in terms of future opportunities for the VMNG program, looking ahead, um, DIVA remains committed to testing this model into future program years, and we're currently negotiating with OneCare on an amendment for the 2024 contract year. Um, DIVA is interested in continuing to use this model to innovate, especially as we look forward to the next multi-state model that has recently been offered by CMMI, the AHEAD model, um, and Vermont's potential participation in this model. Um, part of the new AHEAD model features a hospital global budget component and would require participating states' Medicaid agencies to offer hospital global budgets that align conceptually with Medicare hospital global budgets within the AHEAD model. Um, as such, DIVA and OneCare are currently working to develop and implement for 2024 a global payment program, which would convert a significant portion of hospitals and independent primary care providers, basically the providers who are currently being paid through a fixed perspective payment for Medicaid. Um, it would convert the remaining fee-for-service Medicaid revenue <clears throat> of those providers into fixed payments in a no-risk model that would reconcile back to fee-for-service. So the, this portion of um, 
the fixed payment would reconcile back to fee for service. It would allow these providers to test something that's global budget like um, for one payer Medicaid before any requirements for participating in the AHEAD model with multiple payers in future years, should we decide to participate in the AHEAD model. Um, implementing the, the global payment program in 2024 would also give Medicaid valuable experience to learn about operational considerations as well as ascertaining the appropriate Medicaid authorities for implementing a more comprehensive global budget model well in advance of a potential first year of the AHEAD model, again, should Vermont choose to participate in such. Um, and that first year could potentially be in calendar year 2026. And that is all that I have at this juncture. And it sounds like we're holding questions until the end, so I will just stop there and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about this. Thanks, if we're ready to move on, uh, I'll introduce myself briefly. Uh, I'm Andrew Garland, I'm the Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Uh, my day job uh, is generally in the sales and marketing space, uh, but I still, I still work on uh, our uh, ACO program and all of our our uh, value-based care programming. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our relationship with OneCare and our 2022 results, and uh, <clears throat> then uh, my peer Grace uh, Gilbert Davis will join us uh, to talk about quality, as she is much more knowledgeable about that than I am. So let's jump to the first slide. Uh, this is our healthcare reform philosophy. Uh, those of you who have heard me do this presentation over the last uh, five, six years uh, have seen this, I think, in every deck. Um, I draw your attention to those three bullets uh, in the middle of the philosophy. Of course, you're encouraged to read it all when you have a moment, but um, improved clin clinical outcomes, reducing the cost of care for our members and maintaining an exemplary member experience. Um, those are the criteria that we put on the table uh, for virtually everything that we do. Um, and, and that's how we think about every healthcare reform proposal that that comes across our desks. Um, so uh, you'll you'll um, hear the rest of this presentation in, in light of those uh, those standards. I think we can jump to the next slide where we summarize as we do every year, um, just what's going really well in our relationship with OneCare and, and the program and where we have challenges. Um, you're aware that we um, have put our contract on hold for 2023, uh, but uh, we still had a productive year uh, working with OneCare in 2022. Uh, we developed a, po a post-COVID risk model um, that does uh, promise a significant significant improvement in the shift of reimbursement from fee-for-service um, to incentive-based or value-based um, payments. And we're pretty excited about that model. Uh, I'll talk about the financial results uh, briefly in a minute, but um, the model really is designed to, to correct some of the challenges that we have in the in the current risk model or the risk model that was in place in 2022. Uh, we also worked on a longer a longer term approach to quality uh, with OneCare in 2022. Um, I'll talk in a moment about the quality at a very high level, but many of you have heard me say in the past that one of our challenges, and I, I, I think I see this in the data that we just uh, saw from our other uh, partners that you know, that our quality results haven't tracked in any consistent way. And um, one of our hopes is that by establishing a more long-term approach um, with sustained focus, um, we might start to establish some some trends in, in the quality space where we see meaningful improvement that we can attribute to our work um, and expect to maintain that, that improvement as we move uh, into the future. Uh, challenges, really, it's it's the same challenge that I've cited each year. Um, a lot of good things happening in our work with OneCare, uh, but still we're unable fundamentally to link anything that uh, OneCare has worked on with um, financial or quality progress. Uh, in some cases, the financials look better. In some cases, they look worse. Uh, same with the quality, but really um, what, what we aren't able to do is, is strongly correlate any of those changes with um, the work that we've we've done with OneCare under this program. And then, of course, the new challenge, I think it's important to, to cite that briefly here. The reason 
um, we, we're on hold um, with our formal risk program with One Care is that we have some some data protection issues uh, that we're still working through a, as they move systems uh, to a new a new vendor or new host. I think we can jump ahead now. I believe there's a placeholder slide, and we can go on to the financial results. So um, I'll just remind everybody we established right at the beginning of the uh, the pandemic a new risk model or a, a truncated risk model for this arrangement, knowing uh, that the commercial market was very uh, skeptical of a broad-based payment program like this and um, difficult to convince uh, to participate, um, we felt that it was critically important that the ups and downs of the pandemic were not transmitted back to the market through a value-based care program that produced results that were simply uh, nonsensical, right? Driven by COVID lulls and COVID rushes and not really representing real progress. So, for example, we suspected, and this uh, our ACO partners too, that in, in 2020, we would see a huge fall off in utilization as hospitals and practices had to really limit the flow of patients to maintain safety. Um, we both knew that we could not go back to the market and uh, say that we were making a big payout to one care <laughs> in, in form of shared savings for that um, volume reduction, which was obviously not related. Uh, to our to our work um, in the value-based care space. And frankly, uh, we didn't have then and we still don't have now the methodological expertise, I think, to to adequately sort of separate out what is COVID and sort of perverted utilization from uh, that experience and and what's actually attributable to the work that we do with One Care. And I would just add um, the COVID impacts continued into 2022 for sure. And, and frankly, I think we're continuing to see it in 2023. Um, we've, we've seen some historically aberrant um, utilization this year. Our final settlement uh, for for the QHP population, uh, the exchange population, uh, did not result in any financial transfer uh, between the two parties. Uh, even if it had, I think we had limited uh, the risk uh, transfer to fifty thousand dollars or seventy five thousand uh, dollars for that line of business. Again, we we wanted to stay in the program. We wanted to have a, a risk deal that we could report to CMS and CMMI uh, in those years, uh, but we didn't want any strange payouts. So we brought those corridors uh, way in. Uh, there is a small payment that will come to us um, for the primary cohort uh, from OneCare. That's the large group and ASO co cohort. Uh, but again, uh, from our perspective, not really meaningful. Um, the QHP results are particularly difficult because of a methodology we had included in the old model for trying to understand how coding improvement impacts um, what we see in the risk picture as we evaluate the pools each year. Um, but the, the sample size of our comparison population was just so small um, that the results were really suspect. I had mentioned before that um, we worked on a new methodology with One Care in 2022, and that's ex uh, precisely one of the problems that we knew we needed to solve um, for the sustainability of the model going forward. Uh, so when we get back to it, we, we do have a new approach to that. And our our backwards testing, we, we applied the new methodology to earlier experience uh, in the model. I think we looked at 19 and 20. Um, shows that it it really does a much better job of of modeling um, what what happens. So we're we are excited about that. Um, you know, finally, that last bullet. Uh, generally speaking, it's difficult to correlate uh, cost with our traditional quality measures, uh, the caps measures, the things that we that we measure for uh, all of the accrediting agencies that we work with. Um, the correlations between those measures and costs are just not strong, um, but 
I, I think it's worth saying in this program, we, we couldn't establish any real correlations between positive movements or negative movements on the quality side and uh, the financial results. And with that, we can jump to the next slide. Um, this, uh, this slide I won't attempt to talk to. I have presented it in the past. Uh, I'll just say that as uh, Grace and her team uh, have walked me through the quality measures this year and in past measures, um, I, I've been able to understand that there's a just a degree of volatility here um, that makes it very difficult to say, yeah, that that measure is really being impacted by this program or um, or it's not uh, for the for better or for worse. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Grace. Uh, she'll take take you through these specific measures for the quality uh, health program and show you uh, large group measures. Uh, and I think it's the first time we'll be showing you that data. Um, we finally have uh, the, the numbers we need in the program or had in 2022 uh, and, and some really good work by our data folks to, uh, to segment that out. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, folks. My name is Grace Cover davis and I'm the Corporate Director for um, Value-Based Network Development and Quality Improvement, and I'm pleased to be here today. So a couple housekeeping items about the quality slides we'll review um, today, including this one. A reminder that, um, as Andrew mentioned, due to COVID, um, the 2020 through 2022 agreements, the payment measures were reporting only. And in terms of um, our review today, the quality results that um, with, with uh, numerators and denominators that are less than four are not included um, because they sort of skew the, the, um, the findings. So those are the, the 30 day follow up after discharge from ED for alcohol and other drug dependence. We had a denominator of one, numerator of two, and 30 day follow up after discharge from ED for mental health, denominator of four, numerator of um, four. As in prior years, you know, we see performance ups and downs when comparing 21 and, and 2022. You know, notable improvements include alcohol, other drug initiation and treatment, and depression screening and follow-up. Now, the latter is a is a standing reporting only metric, but it's an, it's an important important metric, we believe. Let's go into the next slide to understand um, the ACO's quality results over time. So this is um, so a sort of complicated graph um, to read, but the, pre the, the previous slide that we just looked at only compared um, 21 and 22 quality results. This graph shows the ACO's impact on Blue Cross members between 2018 and 2022. And a reminder, you know, graph does not include the um, anything with the denominator and numerator less than four. And we also have a separate slide for all cause admissions. So considerable resources were used during this time frame to impart you know, meaningful change, but the trend for Blue Cross members is largely static for these for these uh, metrics. And there's a few exceptions. You know, in 2019, um, A1C port control stood at an impressive 12%, but by 2022 had increased to 20%. This is an inverse measure, so less is best, right? Uh, two other metrics um, realized a 10% decrease over the five years. Here, you know, more is best. So follow up after hospitalization for mental illness, the seven day rate and developmental screening in the first three years of life, um, which again is a, is a standing reporting only measure, but a an important measure. Next slide, please. So here we looked at, rather than comparing 21 and 22 and looking then over the five-year trend, what, what was happening in 2018 when we first began working with the ACO? And how did that compare to the last year we worked with the ACO, which was 2022? So, when we compare um, you know, these quality results, we find that nearly half of the metrics did not improve. So those are the solid, solid blue columns, okay? Um, I should point out that there is an error in here that the, the diabetes column, so um, A1C poor control, you know, greater than nine, um, is actually an improvement, less is best. And that is my error and I apologize for that. Next slide, please.
So as Andrew mentioned, um, for the last three years, we've been collecting um, data for um, large group. In the past, you've only ever seen the results for QHP. So we're pleased to be able to, um, to have this comparison data as well. Um, when compared with QHP, we see more metrics with performance decrease than improvement. Um, notables include, you know, follow-up after hospitalization for mental illness, the seven-day rate, which fell from roughly 72% in 2021 to 47% uh, in 2022. Um, we did see um, a 17% um, improvement, however, for the 30-day follow-up after emergency department visit for alcohol and other drug abuse or dependence. So again, you see this, this um, you see volatility, you see that the results are largely um, static, but here and there, you know, there are some, some outliers, um, both, both positive and negative. Next slide, please. Again, a busy, um, busy graph, but it shows that we trended over time. The large group largely mirrors QHP. The results are largely static, few exceptions. Um, the, both of these uh, graphs sort of, I call them the, the spider graphs, uh, just because they look like spiders. Next slide, please. Here again, we looked at what were the uh, quality results for large group in 2020 when we first began collecting data, and then in 2022. And similar comparison, um, the blue columns indicate uh, quality metrics had improved in 2022 when compared to 2020. And here we see that six out of the nine metrics saw improvements um, in 2022. Those would be the textured blue columns. Next slide, please. And then all cause um, admissions for QHP and large group, the positive downward trend beginning in 2019 and continuing through the COVID years or 2020, 2021-ish, um, increased in 2022 for both QHP and large group. You know, I would, I would suggest that this is most likely a result of COVID and one would expect to see the downward trend continue for other commercial payers in 20 and, and, one, and Blue Cross in 2023. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we wanted to share a little bit about um, our other quality and total cost of care or value-based care work with you. Um, you know, we continued to honor um, the all-payer model in, in, in 2023 throughout this um, year by taking the, the $3.25 PMPM that we were paying um, to one care who was then uh, passing it through to the, the to primary care providers and their network, we continue to um, make those payments directly to the PCPs in 2023. In 2024, our plan is to reallocate those resources formerly used um, for the ACO, and that includes not just the dollars, but the large number of staff who were very focused on um, the ACO uh, relationship and, and agreement, using those um, individuals and these dollars to focus on a growing portfolio of value-based care programs. And there are two that are notable. Um, one is uh, Vermont Blue Integrated Care or VBIC. Uh, I'm sure you we've talked about this with the Green Mountain Care Board before and with, with other groups, but this is an advanced primary care model that was created with the help of for primary care practices, most notably um, Evergreen Family Practice. We're in year one of a two-year pilot, so 2024 will be our, our second year. The quality metrics um, include disease management uh, and we utilization metrics for reducing total cost of care. And then the program elements, um, we really are, really are trying to look at what what do our members need? What do, what do Vermonters need? And so we we are focusing on you know mental health mental health substance use disorder services. Um, we are definitely um, working with the VBIC practices um, as well as other entities to um, to address collaborative care coordination so that we reduce duplication of effort in case management. And then um, we're pretty um, 
proud of the advancements we've made um, in our data sharing and reporting, practice specific reporting, not HSA um, level reporting, but practice specific reporting for quality and total cost of care metrics. The second program is, is really new for, for 2024 and um, there'll be more information coming out about it um, in our um, response to the, the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, but the bottom line is it's, it's the, um, the association has created a database, a very large database where we, they will be able to generate scorecards using population and condition-based metrics, as well as total cost of care measures. They're risk adjusted for health status of the providers, patients, panel. So each provider will have a scorecard and they, we will be reimbursing them a, a, um, a value-based PMPM based on their scorecard. Now, both of these programs have some um, similarities. They are ACO agnostic, meaning if a VBIC practice is part of um, the ACO, that's fine. That works. It works with an advanced primary care model like VBIC and with a program um, like the Enhanced Community Primary Care, or ECPC, as we call it. Um, both of these programs are dedicated to independent community providers and, and the providers who work in FQHCs. And then, as I noted, additional information will be um, forthcoming about both of these programs. Um, and we have an um, alignment assessment due to, to you folks agreement on Care Board um, on December 1st. And we can go to the next slide. Um, I forget if we're taking questions and answers now or we're going to wait till the end. There is an appendix with the scorecards. Um, please feel free to review this material. and. Um, yeah, we're open for questions and answers at any point. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carla Renders. I'm the Director of Network Management um, for Northern New York and Vermont here at MVP. I'm accompanied today by three of my colleagues, um, Scott Momrow, our Vice President of Network Strategy, Matthew McKinnon, Vice President of Network Management and Contracting, and Jordan Esty, our Senior Director of Government Affairs. So we can go to the first slide, please. So I always like to kick off presentations with MVP's mission statement and our guiding principles of improving health and providing peace of mind to our members. We do this through our core values, which are being the difference for our customers by making them feel reassured their health care needs will be met. We're curious as to their wants and needs and work to anticipate and address those needs for a better consumer experience. And finally, we aspire to be humble as humility allows us to keep an open mind and be receptive to innovative ideas from all of our constituents, be they employees, employer groups, members, providers, or partners such as OneCare. Um, next slide. Well, actually, you can go to the fourth slide, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> So we'll get right into the components of our 2022 arrangement. This is the third year of the MVP One Care arrangement, and 22 um, was very similar to 2021 in terms of our contractual components. Um, the program continues to co cover commercial lives under qualified health plans. So those are individual and small group memberships sold on the Vermont Exchange. Um, 22 continued the upside only total cost of care shared savings arrangement with the amount of savings being subject to a quality gate. Um, the quality metrics, the quality metrics that we utilized for the quality gate were metrics selected from the all payer model and were the same as what was utilized in 2021. As part of the arrangement, MVP provides OneCare with eligibility, claims, and financial analytics for the attributed population on a monthly basis. And finally, MVP did continue in 2022 to provide a monthly primary care investment payment, which is then distributed to the downstream providers in support of um, the OneCare population health model. Okay, next slide. So looking at the, this is, this slide is looking at the results of the 2022 performance year. Although the financial results were not optimal for 2022, the final settlement deficit of 2.9% 
was far less than what we saw in 2021 when we had a 24% budget overage um, due to the ongoing COVID testing and treatment services and of course the onslaught in general of um, utilization after the long period of reduced utilization which we saw in 2020. So what the bar graph is showing here um, is how one care performed in orange compared to the budget in blue by quarter and on a per member per month basis. There were around 8,900 members in the performance period, which actually was a reduction from 2021. The percentages that you see shown represent the percentage deficit for each quarter. So as you can see, we started the year with a budget overage of about 18%, and then by quarter four, it had come down quite a bit to a little bit under 3%. Because savings were not achieved, there was no distribution of dollars between MVP and OneCare. Okay, next slide. So why did we end up over budget in 22? Um, the contributors were as follows. First, compared to the market population risk score, which increased by 5% in 2022, the OneCare population risk score increased by 20% meaning there were sicker patients in the measurement period as compared to the market population. Additionally, which does correspond to the risk score increase, we also saw increases in ancillary facility services, such as lab, cancer therapies, and imaging, and finally, in outpatient surgeries. These were not, of course, the only contributors to the overage, but they were the most substantial. We can move on to quality. Um, on slide eight, the 2022 program was again similar to 2021. The quality metrics were selected by OneCare using the standard all payer model metrics. Um, CMS 2021 benchmarks were utilized. Um, we have a point system which determines the amount of shared savings due to OneCare. Since this year, there were, were not any, not this year, but in 2022, there were not any shared savings, so that is not as relevant. It should be noted that three of the measures had such low member denominators that the points for those measures had to be redistributed. We only look at metrics that have 30 or more members in the denominator as we um, determine that to be statistically significant. So moving to the next slide, <clears throat> This is um, a depiction of the quality scorecard that we um, distribute to OneCare at the end of the settlement period. Um, again, the, this scorecard does play a role in the event that there were shared savings. So more of the savings is shared based on quality performance. Again, this was not applicable in 2022. So describing what you see here, the, the quality scorecard is worth 100 points with each metric being worth around 12 points. Um, like I said, um, th for three of the metrics, the points were redistributed because of the low denominator. So that was follow up for um, alcohol and substance abuse after an ED visit, seven day follow up for mental health after hospitalization and 30 day follow up for mental health after an ED visit. Um, points are rewarded based on the scale that you see at the bottom of the slide. So zero points if um, below the 20, 50th, I'm sorry, percentile is achieved. 50% of the points are earned for the 50th percentile, 75% of the points for the 75th percentile, and all 20 points if the 90 per, 90th percentile is reached. Again, this was not an optimal performance year for quality either. While controlling high blood pressure remained static compared to last year at the 50th percentile, as well as the HbA1c control also remaining at the 90th percentile, there was a drop in wellness visits from the 90th to the 75th percentile. And for all cause readmissions, um, one care drop from the 90th to under the 50th percentile, hence resulting in an overall low overall performance score. Both MVP and One Care have recognized that these are not the outcomes that we anticipated or that we feel are acceptable. But as we move into the next slide, we will review what we're doing differently in this year and in 2024 to remediate that. So as 
I just said, in 2023, we entered into a, an agreement to address opportunities for improvement and continue to do so in our contract negotiations for 2024. In 2023, we did move to a true risk arrangement. So the parties will share in losses as well as savings, um, meaning we both have more skin in the game. We introduced a new metric to the scorecard, which needed improvement in the MVP population. And that was colorectal cancer screenings, as well as kept the existing metrics one cares selected that align across their arrangements. We, of course, continue to be committed to the ongoing conversations around global budgets to improve health care costs for Vermonters. And finally, MVP um, has a new department within our organization called Provider Engagement, which is focused on arrangements such as these um, to, to create, to assure success, to create an account plan, which is really a narrative on how the parties will collaborate to achieve the goal set in the contract. And that and the provider engagement account manager and myself, along with other stakeholders at OneCare, um, have begun to meet monthly to review how the arrangement's going, um, you know, answer any questions on attribution, financial statements, or other issues as needed. And then moving on to our 2024 arrangement, which is still in negotiation, we are continuing the downside risk arrangement. But aside from the total cost of care component, we are building in opportunities for improvement on wellness visits and mental health screenings, as well as a separate quality program that is laser focused on just two metrics for performance improvement, as well as continuing um, the, the metrics that you just saw in the quality scorecard. We're also involved in the valuable discussions to standardize the way we review and track social determinants of health that impact the overall health and well-being of our Vermont members. And um, of course, that's more focused on government programs and not commercial products, but it's another point of collaboration with OneCare and other constituents in Vermont. And finally, um, we are going to see more MVP membership covered under the arrangement is in 2024. MVP did update its attribution platform this year, and we are showing um, prospectively almost double the Vermont membership um, attributed to this program. Because that's because we're looking at things like more recency of member activity and full scope of services, not just preventive visits in e &M. So that means more of the population will be benefiting, hopefully, from the arrangement in 2024. So that concludes MVP's presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to all the payers for what you have shared. I'm Carrie Wolfman. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at OneCare Vermont. And I am joined today by two staff members um, on the quality and payment reform team at OneCare. Derek Raines, the Director of Payment Reform, is here. And Jody Fry, who is our Assistant Director of the Population Health Model Integration. Next slide, please. So a lot of what is on this slide, again, very busy, as others have commented. Um, a lot of what is here has already been shared, but we thought it would be a good uh, picture, a snapshot uh, across all of you payers uh, from 20 to 22 to compare progress. Where you see an NA, there is no applicable benchmark available. And where you see a green box, it means that payer is not tracking that metric. Some of the things I'll point out um, that, again, may have already been mentioned. Um, one is that the best score across all pairs is in diabetes control. And I think you probably already know that and heard that. Uh, that is a little more than halfway down, and it shows across all pairs we are in Vermont um, at the 90th percentile or greater for controlling diabetes, um, the A1C greater than 9 metric. Another thing I want to point out on this slide is a metric that we have not been budging across all payers, which concerns me and I think should be a focus area, is controlling high blood pressure. That is right under the diabetes metric. So as you can see, uh, 2021 and 22, across the payers, we're only at the 50th, at best 70th percentile in Medicare, and 50th across the other payers. Where we fall down the most are in some of the metrics related to alcohol and other drug abuse independence and engagement in treatment for the same. 
so less than the 25th percentile and at the 25th percentile, as Amy already pointed out, for the Medicaid population that is attributed to OneCare. So I'll just pause a moment and let you look at this. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these, and many of them have already been mentioned. I think the all-cause readmissions uh, line, maybe one more we should point to, um, declining uh, from 21 to 22 in Blue Cross, both for QHP and large group, as well as in, in uh, MVP. So let's move ahead. We may want to come back to this if we have questions related. This slide shows um, our population health um, evolution from 23 to 24. So what levers does OneCare have to really create change related to these quality metrics? We have data and analytics that we share with our network, and we provide financial incentives to work on certain areas. So this slide is showing the areas that we are incentivizing both this year and next year. And there is a little bit of change, um, which I will go through in a moment, but I want you to know that these are claims-based measures, except for the controlling hypertension metric in 24. The rest are claims-based. These are standardized, not custom. So that's a change we are making intentionally. National benchmarks are being set are, as our targets. And we continue to make um, um, emphasis or emphasize focused areas that include wellness, prevention, the management of chronic disease, ED utilization, and mental health treatment. And we are also sunsetting inverse measures. We've had a lot of feedback that when lower is better, um, that is not intuitive. People would like their metrics um, to be not inverse so that higher is better. We are retiring from 23 to 24. The very first metric listed um, is diabetes. We're retiring that because of the success that I just showed you on the last slide. We are um, in the hypertension metric, moving from a custom measure this year to back to the controlling high blood pressure um, HEDIS measure for 24. And then the third line down, I want to point out um, the X's across all the boxes, all the continuum of care partners um, in 24, we are asking them to work on um, follow-up after emergency department visits for patients with multiple chronic conditions. And this also is a proxy for helping control the cost of care because we know that reducing um, or having follow-up like this will reduce readmissions and um, uh, uh, visit back to the ED as well. So you can also see some of the other metrics that the payers have mentioned today already are built into our incentive program for 24, developmental screening, wellness visits, um, et cetera. Um, another point of emphasis is that we are adding um, incentives for people to work on the lowest performing metrics, the initiation of substance use disorder treatment and engagement in that. All right, next slide, please. In selecting the areas of focus for the population health model in 2024, consideration was given uh, to these things that are listed here. So what data do we have available? Because we want all of our work and our advice that we give to be data-driven. The metrics are included in our payer contracts, as you've just heard. And aligning across the payers, I think, is very important as we move forward. We have not always been aligned, but wouldn't it be great if we can all work across the payers on the same metrics so that providers can focus on the areas for their patients where there is the most need? We are using our performance levels. So over time, how have we been doing in the recent past and currently? Um, and we're using that to inform um, the population health model incentive areas for 24. We want there to be the ability to influence results built into this model. We want there to not be too much provider burden. So again, alignment uh, as a primary care physician when I'm asked to work on a multitude of different measures dependent on XYZ payer, 
Um, it's confusing and often there is a lack of engagement in focusing on any of them. So the more we can align, the better. We like standard measures because we like to explain the definition and have the specifications um, and not have to think hard about what the measures mean. The measures need to be applicable across populations, again, payers, and also our continuum of care partners. They, the measures need to be meaningful to all of those in the state of Vermont who are providing care to our patients. And really importantly, we have received feedback from our providers and used that feedback to inform our incentivized areas going forward. The percentile targets in the population health model are chosen based on national uh, benchmarks, and they are set relative to current performance levels, so pushing us to improve over time. The selections have also been corroborated by our benchmarking and our evaluation report outcomes. And for you members of the Green Mountain Care Board, you've already heard me say this, that we have met with some similar ACOs who are performing better than we are in certain areas like patient experience, ED utilization, and other primary care areas, um, and are learning from them uh, about some of the ways that we can support our network in improving in these areas. While we're here, I'll just point out uh, something that I think you all know. We don't provide care. Our ACO does not provide care. We are on 20 plus different EHRs, which complicates um, all of this work. And also, I want it to be emphasized that providers don't distinguish between ACO attributed patients and non ACO attributed patients. So if if I have uh, a patient who is not controlled with their blood pressure, I don't usually know if they're an ACO patient or not, and I treat them the same way. And so when we're looking at these quality slides, I think it would be very smart if we could compare quality work on the attributed lives as we have today and compare that to what's going on with the unattributed population. And as somebody pointed out, the risk stratification of each of those groups also is really important to know. So are the things that have been shown in the slides before really impacted by the ACO? Or if we looked at the unattributed lives, would the numbers be the same? The last slide I have is just an example of when we meet with our network, what we're showing them to try to incentivize them to work on these areas. So we're meeting with them on a regular basis down to the practice level. We provide this uh, information on a regular quarterly basis. We give them lots of other time when we're not meeting. Uh, they have access to us to ask us questions about their work and um, what they might need to do um, to improve in these areas that we're incentivizing. We also think it's very important to show them what money is on the table, what they may have earned already, and what they could still earn if they would improve in the metrics that we are incentivizing. So that, those were the slides and comments that I have for today. I had one more that I added in because of the discussion we've had today, and that is on the CAPS measures. Um, patient experience is a very difficult thing to measure. And as a provider, I can let you know, providers don't like CAPS assessments at all, don't think they are a reliable picture of what's happening, at, the, at least at the primary care level. And some of the conversations with the um, higher performing ACOs in this area in particular um, have given us some good ideas about um, care navigators for patients, um, continuing to work on team-based care so that we have wraparound services for the patients. Access is a big issue when it comes to patient experience, so is communication. And then another big area, education was mentioned earlier, but medication reconciliation is, is one of the top most important areas um, where we could improve all across the state, across the nation for that matter, um, when it comes to patient experience. And so um, things like having a pharmacist on the team that can meet with patients and do medication reconciliation is another idea that we have learned from um, one of our ACO conversations. So happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gray, did you have anything else or should we go to board member questions and comments? Okay. 
No, I think we can turn right to board questions and comments. Okay, all right. I'll open it up to any board members that may have questions or comments. I will keep the slides up if you want to refer to a certain slide. I know that the numbering is odd because of the way that the presentation was combined. So just let me know where to navigate to. Thank you, Michelle. I have a question, so I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I appreciated, Andrew, your commentary around sort of the COVID influences of 2020 through 2022. Um, and certainly I think that it's easy to kind of think through some of that on the fight, maybe not easy, but you can certainly see how that impact the care pattern disruptions impact the financial component. I'm wondering if, and this can be really to anyone, if anyone would comment on um, what they think the potential impact is in relationship to the quality measures. Yeah, um, I'll defer to the quality people, but Great question, and intuitively, it's it's had to have had a huge impact. Um, access has just been so skewed, uh, and folks have just had other things to contend with. Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, Robin, this is Grace. I'll just add that if you if you look at the graphs for QHP and large group during the you know the core um, right there is one during the core um, COVID years, I mean you can definitely see that we saw a decrease in in the quality scores overall. Um, but what's telling is that um, again. If you look at 2018, when Blue Cross started with One Care in 2022, our last um, agreement period, there doesn't seem to be any change. Um, and maybe that's a result, you know, a, a lingering result of COVID on quality. Um, I, I guess time will tell, right? Thanks. I, I appreciate. And I appreciate if anyone else it. wants to chime in with any other uh, thoughts, I'd I'd love to hear it. But um, I I know it's somewhat of a unknown still. So, but thank you for your thoughts. Oh, and actually, I had one other question um, for MVP. So it. I was curious why you don't risk adjust the benchmark, the ACO benchmark, given that you saw such a difference in the risk uh, between the overall QHP population and the ACO population. Um, we do. There is a risk adjustment factor applied. There, so there is. Okay, but it just it sounds like if this was contributing, that maybe that risk adjustment factor didn't. Like really, enough, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for thanks sure. for that. I, I could pop in with a couple of questions. Um, hey, Michelle, a quick question on the caps scoring. Is this a, a a national comparison group of all Medicare, or is this an ACO attributed medic uh, comparison group? What's the CAPS comparison group that we're comparing to here? I will triple check. Or do you know? My answer is MSSP ACOs. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then, and then do you know the, uh, the definition of the stewardship of patient resources I score? I, I appreciate it because I was, when, when you mentioned you had it at your fingertips, I was looking forward to this. I, I do. Uh, so stewardship of patient resources is actually just one question, and it is, in the last six months, did you and anyone on your healthcare team talk about how much your prescription medicines cost? Oh. Okay. Um, and then um, I had a question uh, for the DIVA folks on the fee-for-service component uh, you had the graph there where there's the fixed perspective payment, and the fee for service payment, 
and, and I was trying to understand if, if do we have any further breakdown of the fee for service payment, if that's out of state, if it's um, people in state getting care at uh, non one care providers or and, and the other question I have is, is Brattleboro uh, in the fee for service camp or the fixed perspective, fixed perspective payment camp Brattleboro uh, retreat admissions? Yeah. Um, so we do have a breakdown of um, what we call the one care in network fee for service component of the orange part of the stacked bar chart, the fee for service and um, the out of one care network component. Um, we don't further break that down into what's in and out of state or Divas Medicaid network, um, but I can get that detail to you if you're interested in that and also the retreat is not included um, in the total cost of care. Oh, that's out of the total cost of care that we see here. Yeah, I okay. believe that a lot of the retreat spend is from a Department of Mental Health fund source rather than a DIVA fund source at this juncture. And so it's excluded from the total cost of care. Okay. And then the other question that I, that I have, and I think I probably know the answer on this, is do you know if people who receive drug and alcohol uh, counseling and treatment at places like uh, the, the various recovery coach um, agencies in the state that are not submitting a bill for that, are they getting captured in the reporting, quality reporting? If, if it's not for measures where claims are captured, I, I would have to get back to you on that as well. I do know that um, for some of the Medicaid measures, additional sources of information are used in addition to claims for some of those things that are not claims based. Um, I don't think we adjust it in the VMNG program. I think DIVA does for some of its measures, but we we just take the raw numerators and denominators based on claims in the VMNG program. Okay. Just as from a clinical yeah. standpoint, I would say the majority of patients that I see in the emergency department who have follow up for drug and al alcohol counseling uh, have counseling th with recovery coach agencies like Turning Point or something. And I don't, I believe they do not bill or submit a claim. So I think there's probably that we, we may be performing better than we think there because yep. I think a lot of people are getting care outside of the you know, the, yeah. the confines of the claims based system. So um, I will speak to that also. So the the way that that's currently measured, and I'll speak specifically to Medicare, but also to the way that we calculated in all pair model reporting, it is a HEDIS based measure. So it follows HEDIS specifications. We do recognize that there are other avenues by which someone in the state of Vermont could receive and very likely does receive um, different types of follow-up treatment. And as Amy mentioned, Medicaid has done some work to propose changes to HEDIS specifications for the Vermont population. Um, but to the extent that those would be included in, in any of the federal reporting, it's not for Medicare or for the state's federal reporting um, that's not currently happening. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a few other questions in the Blue Cross presentation. You mentioned that there's um, you're seeing historical aberrant utilization right now in certain areas. Are there? Could you speak to areas that you're seeing aberrant utilization currently? Oh, I think you're on mute. So, thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm afraid that I cannot. Uh, we, I do have a few other folks on the team. Um, I I tend to see the uh, the roll up numbers. And I'm I'm just aware that we've had several months, uh, several times this year with just historically high um, utilization and cost, just really higher than anything we've seen in a long time. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the call from Blue Cross can uh, speak a little bit more about the details. I, I do know that some of it has been driven by very high cost claims. Um, which which have been unusually high, but I, I think there's more going on there than that. Um, Andrew, it's great. I can't speak to the detail either, but if there is no one else from Blue Cross on the call who can, Dr. Merman, we're, we're happy to, to get that follow-up yeah. to you. 
um, just give if you could give us a week or so. Um, we're just having some internet issues right now. Yeah, right, right. I heard. All right, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm I'm glad you're here, given your internet issues right now as well. So, <laughs> um, and then uh, for Dr. Wolfman, I you know you you brought up some interesting uh, questions regarding um, measurements and um, you had mentioned access as, as an area to, to think about measuring in the future. And I was just curious if you had any thoughts about uh, rational ways that we could measure access. Thank you, Dr. Merman. I brought access up when I was talking about the patient experience um, questionnaire um, and commented that patient, what patients want is access to care when they want it, where they want it right now. Um, so I think that affects um, the patient experience responses. But more importantly, what can we do and, and what are we trying to do to, in, to help with access to care? I think um, the answer to that is we have built uh, that into our, our um, population health model by incentivizing certain types of appointments, follow up after ED visits, follow up after hospitalizations within seven days, annual wellness visits, mental health follow-up, et cetera. So I think the best, you know, I can't tell practices you need to add two more appointments per day. Um, I can tell myself that and I can add telehealth at night. You know, we have ideas, but you can't make people do these things, but we can incentivize them. That's one of our levers. We can give them the data and analytics showing how they're performing on these measures. And then we can incentivize them in different ways to perform better um, by getting their patients into the type of point appointments that are needed and also desired by the patients. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, and thank you, everybody. This was a really interesting presentation. Um, Mr. Raines, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Foster. I appreciate it. Um, just one other thing that I wanted to add for the benefit of the board. Um, one other area that we're really digging into the access issue is within the CPR program. Um, we've we've made it a requirement of the program under the policy that the practices work with us on a plan to improve access in the state of Vermont. Um, it's a huge undertaking, obviously. So. Um, we've started leaning into that body of work and discussing it with the CPR practices. Um, given that they're in the thick of the access problem, it can be a little challenging asking them to help us solve it, as I'm sure you can understand. Um, but we have started to undertake that work, so I think that that's another area that's worth highlighting in response to that specific question. Yeah, if I could have one follow-up, why, why, why the CPR program? I'm sorry, I don't I don't know that I fully understand the question. Oh, you said that they're, you're focusing on the CPR program. They must increase access and work with one care on addressing the access issues. And I guess my question is why limited, why the CPR program and not the broader network? Good question. Sorry, I just didn't fully understand what you meant. So I think we generally consider the CPR practice or the CPR practices of the program in general to be a bit of a primary care incubator of sorts. Um, in the sense that we're paying a fixed payment, it does represent uh, a benefit above and beyond fee for service, as you know um, from from previous explanations of the program. Um, so I think it's I think it's more productive when we work with providers that are in in that sort of an environment as opposed to working with providers who are in more of maybe say a traditional fee for service environment. All right, thank you. Um, member okay. Holmes or Member Walsh, do you have any other questions or comments? Sure. Um, this is Tom, if that's okay. Jess, do you mind? Um, no, no real questions. I, um, I appreciate everybody coming and I appreciate the information that's been shared. Um, I also appreciate that earlier in the fall uh, during the um, budget hearing, there was a dramatic change um, in the description of the work that the ACO would be doing. And these data predate any of those changes. Um, uh, 
I, I think I'm just going to be blunt about observations from these data. Um, the data that are that have been presented um, don't allow me, and evidently Mr. Garland either, to have any sense of what the ACO has done to change the way that care is delivered or change um, savings. There have been savings some year in some payers, but not consistently. Quality measures have gone up and down in different payers in different years, um, like a scattershot. And there hasn't been any material presented to me over the last two years where I can say that here's a data point, here's an action that was taken meant to change that data point, and here's the change, good or bad, that occurred. There's no line of causality. That's disturbing. We're seven or eight years into an expensive experiment. And I don't think there's any way to know whether it's worked at all. It's tempting to conclude that the quality measures have gotten worse. I'm reluctant to draw that conclusion because causality is not possible to determine. I think the quality measure scores declining are a symptom of our healthcare system being under stress. I think the changes that we're seeing in quality measures and healthcare spending, we are seeing while we have an accountable care organization in the state, not because we have an accountable care organization. And it's frustrating that we're seven or so years in and we can't draw a line to what's been happening. Um, I'm still not sure what to do about that, but I find it frustrating. And those are my observations. Oh, one one more thing that I find a little, I find um, also um, tough to reconcile. Um, the CPR and PMH payments have been going to providers and systems prospectively, and in addition to be what would be expected for fee for service as the gentleman was just saying a few moments before, those payments were meant to help organizations transform from fee-for-service to alternative payment models. One way of assessing whether an organization has transformed is its risk tolerance. The acceptance, the acceptance of more risk would be evidence that the, the organization has readied itself to move from fee-for-service to alternative payment models. And we've not seen any substantial change in risk bearing. So it's hard to say that there's been transformation. Uh, so those are my observations. Uh, and I'll pass it back to you, Chair. Chair Foster, I can go unless you want to go first. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, I, th I think that uh, Dr. Wolfman raised a good point about it's really meaningful to compare savings and quality changes between the attributed population and the non-attributed population. Um, and so, and I also think there have been enrollment changes and risk changes over this time period. So I guess part of one of my questions is, um, are any of the payers doing an assessment of, you know, the attributed population to the non-attributed population um, to see whether these same quality changes, ups and downs are happening in the non-attributed population? Um, and similarly, is has anybody, any of the payers, taken a look at the continuously enrolled population. So to see, you know, I was uh, an attributed member in 2018, and now I'm an attributed member and still in 2022, and what's happened to the total cost of care for that, page, that patient population and the uh, quality for that patient population. So I'm just throwing that out there as a, I think to some degree would, um, help answer member Walsh's question about can we, 
it's still not going to be, you know, clean on causality, but it will get rid of some of the confounds. Um, so I'm just wondering if the payers have have done that or what we can learn from that type of an analysis if it's been done. Well, that's a tough set of questions, but I'll give a start. Um, so great observations. Um, there are so many factors impacting these populations besides what's happening with the one care or has happened with one care that that is unquestionably so, especially the QHP. Um, the membership churn in that population is much closer to to what we're probably used to with a Medicaid population than with a traditional commercial population. Um, you know, even with members kind of coming off and back on the rolls in the same year as, as finances change. Um, as you also noted, we have programming aimed at cost and quality. Uh, a lot of others do too, uh, who, who aren't a part of this, this conversation or this relationship. Um, in the past, we have done the commercial non-attributed versus the commercial attributed analysis. And um, actually what we found was counterintuitive. Um, the the non-attributed population did better uh, than the attributed population um, pretty consistently. Now, I don't believe we've updated that analysis in a year or two. It's pretty time consuming. Um, and just given where we are, um, it, it hasn't been at the top of the heap. Uh, the other thing I would say about the quality measures, and I'll invite Grace to say more about this, I'm uh, sure that ours have some um, up and down <laughs> randomness to them too. Again, there's a lot of things that happen in the population that can affect that. Um, a key difference though, is that when we run quality projects or quality initiatives at Blue Cross, you know, we start with a pretty strong hypothesis about what we're going to impact. And we do everything we can to try to trace that impact to the quality measures that we we then record later. Um, that's not a perfect process. I'm sure our, our data folks could tell us all the variables that are hard to control in that analysis. Um, but we hold ourselves accountable to that and we can generally see, yeah, the work we did impacted the population in the way that we expected it to. Um, so I think that's a partial answer to your question. I, I hope that helps somewhat and I'll, I'll defer to Grace. Um, yeah, really good questions. We actually had started the update um, to the, um, the assessment of attributed versus non-attributed in terms of the quality metrics. And as um, Andrew said, it is a huge lift. We are close to having it done. We are happy to share it with you. Um, but just from the preliminary results that I saw, in other words, we're to the point now where we're gonna, we, we need to double check, right? The, the, um, the data points, but just from the preliminary um, view, it, it, it is exactly what Andrew described. The, the non-attributed cohort is generally outperforming the attributed cohort. Do, do we know why? No. Um, and I suspect that would take quite a while to figure, figure that one out. Yes. But I will say this, in terms of the attributed members, again, from Bucos, there's been a considerable investment toward improving the quality metrics for the attributed lives um, above and beyond what we as an organization invest in, you know, helping our members to have, you know, the best, the best care that they can get. So I would have expected that because of that, you know, 12 million plus dollar investment, we would have seen better results in the attributed cohort. Yeah, uh, thanks, yeah, Grace. Uh, thanks, just Grace. add one more quick uh, clarification. You asked about the continuously enrolled population. We have analyzed that. Uh, I wish Martine was on this call to give us the details. I, I have not looked at that in a while. I do recall that that population is getting smaller and smaller. And we even worked with OneCare to try to use the 
trend that we're finding in that population to inform the risk model. Um, so I'll I'll take it as a follow up to connect back with Martine and summarize what we've learned through that analysis, and I'll I'll share that back with you. That sounds great. Thank you. I don't know if MVP has any thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to interject that while MVP has not done an analysis on quality for the one care population compared to um, the market population, we did um, for the financials. And the outcome was actually better in the one care population than for the market population. As a matter of fact, we were applying a market trend factor um, to the the budgeted um, target quarterly and one care did outperform. However, again, it's hard to trace that back to something in particular um, in terms of work one care has, has done or interventions they've made. Um, additionally, the attributed population this year isn't um, the best representation of what the attributed population should be for MVP as we had some inherent issues with our attribution that we've corrected and we've also updated our attribution methodology in general um, and we're having much better outcomes with it. So we'll have to see how things trend in 23. Thank you. That's great. I mean, I think going forward, this would be really helpful um, types of analyses to see um, if that's something that, you know, going forward we can, you can do. Um, another thing, I guess, for me personally, looking at the the slides and seeing the deltas between 2021 and 2022 and up arrows and down arrows, um, it would be really helpful to assign statistical significance to those changes. Because as you look at some of those changes and it's counted as an up or as a down, and you look just eyeballing it, <laughs> to me, it looks more flat than up or down uh, for some of them. Some of them definitely appear like I can imagine they might be statistically significant changes. But I think just from you know a naked eye look, and I understand there's small denominators as well. I think some of the reports to me, um, you know, when, when there's a denominator of four or one, to me, it, it's rather meaningless. And I know that, um, you know, uh, some of that is subtracted from the um, analysis as well if the denominator is really small, but it would just really, I think, help to shape our understanding of what's what's really changing by statistical significance of those changes. Um, so th those are, you know, two kind of observations there uh, or questions there. I guess I would just ask if there's any insights that the, the results that struck me um, were involved, I mean, a lot of things struck me to be fair, but um, the, the, the two that I thought I would ask about because it seemed so interesting and troubling was the all-cause readmissions, if anybody has any insights into what is happening there. Um, and then in terms of the 30-day follow-up after discharge from the ED for mental health, and then there was the similar uh, follow-up after a mental health admission, in some of the other uh, payer data, it's all over the place. I mean, so I just thought, what is happening there? To, to Dr. Wolfman's point, everybody is treated similarly, but we're seeing a huge uh, increase in follow-up for Medicare patients or Medicaid patients um, after a, a mental health ED visit and a huge reduction after a medic for a Medicare patient. Uh, the swings seem rather wild, and I'm just trying to understand that. And then the 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 uh, unfortunate, de you know, decline in the in the quality metric related to all cause readmissions. Both of those struck me as worthy of asking questions about. If anybody has any insights or intel that might explain some of the wide variations on the mental health and then the all cause readmissions, and maybe that's a one care question. Since, but I but I would ask anybody. I can go ahead. I did have my hand up for another point that I wanted to make really quickly, which is if people start doing the comparison between the attributed and unattributed groups, uh, let's remember to risk stratify them clinically. This is using risk a different way um, and include the social determinants of health in that total all person risk, because that is a big influencer. Um, and then to this question, I think we'll need to research some of the payer to payer variation. 
Um, we have some some more recent data in. I cannot answer why uh, for Blue Cross and MVP the all cause readmissions um, success was worse actually in 22 than 21. I do think that we we still cannot explain all of the impact that the pandemic has had and actually continues to have. So that may be a factor when it comes to the the um, good results on follow up um, for the Medicaid population um, after an ED visit for mental health. Most likely that is due to concerted effort. By certain groups and again, I that is a uh, claims based um, result, so we'd have to do some more research, but I can get back to you on that. I know, um, you know. You we improve what we focus on. If we don't focus on it, we usually don't impact it quite as much. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and I guess my final question uh, is for you, Andrew, with respect to um, you mentioned the new challenge um, as you know, absent systemic protections for Blue Cross Blue Shield member data, the transition of ACO data operations to UV UVM Health Network remains problematic. And so I guess my question there would be, what systemic protections would you like to see uh, in place in that, in the, you know, in that transition? Yeah, um, I don't have any of our attorneys on the call who worked on this issue. Um, this is pretty specialized stuff. But we do have a pretty good memo together um, <clears throat> that we sent to OneCare last year, sort of detailing the issues that need to be resolved. Uh, so I think we could we could uh, redact that memo and send you the sort of the key points. Um, <clears throat> but but basically, you know, we're we're in a situation where the data is being moved to an organization that we work with on multiple levels. Um, and we just have to be sure that when they're accessing the data, um, that it's being used strictly for the purpose that it's transmitted for, right? Solely for <clears throat> ACO operations and reporting, <clears throat> and that it doesn't find its way into other uses um, <clears throat> that we, uh, that, that <laughs> we have, as I said, we have a, a multifaceted relationship with with UVMHN, and, and we just need to make sure we keep the lanes clear. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I think it would just be helpful for us to understand what would be the protection to, that, you know, you'd like to see in place. Yep, it's very clear cut. And I think all of it comes from a rule or NCQA standard or HIPAA standard. So um, it's, it's pretty standard stuff. Great. Thank you. That's all I have, Chair Foster. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple questions I had are a little similar, so if they are a little repetitive, I apologize. Um, but it seems as though in some years there's pretty good savings for one payer. On the same year, there's no savings or minimal savings or even losses for a different payer. And I was trying to understand that. What explains that? Can maybe take a stab at that. Sure. So the question is why in a given year we might do well on a total cost of care program with one payer and not with another payer? Correct. Yeah, so so I would say probably the most, like the reason that comes to mind most immediately is just the fact that we, uh, that we use different processes for setting the targets with the different payers and they're based on different cohorts of patients. So they present very different base years. Um, there are different factors that come into play in, in negotiating the performance year target. Um, so for example, the process with Medicaid is very different than that with Medicare, as you know. Um, so I think all of these different factors just come into play to result in targets that are very unlikely just by the, the nature of probability to perform consistently. How do we think about and segregate out sort of the math problem or the math that's being done to set targets from um, 
interventions or one care programmatic efforts that result in savings? I think that's kind of a tricky question for me to answer myself, but I can tell you what my particular corner of one care is trying to do to address that. I think I can get to that more directly. So, um, as you can probably imagine, when we work within the confines of one year programs, it can be difficult to really isolate factors that are driving performance year over year. Um, because from one year to the next year, you know, th things can be very different at a given facility or, or otherwise, you know, just based on natural factors. Um, but a lot of what we're trying to do now is give the network a better look at what's changing from the base year to the performance year. So there's a lot of focus on that in our HSA consultations. We're starting to report on it more widely uh, in other in other forums. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that work was something that OneCare was doing before the pandemic and is now kind of returning to now that now that we have base year and performance year data that's not so marred by pandemic patterns and 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 things that that really dictate sort of how providers had to react to the market rather than sort of like trying to trying to you know be the owners of their own behavior so to speak right. sure um, in, sorry oh no please go I ahead add one point to that i think um just sort of that is a really nice placeholder for just a reminder that Lindsay and I will be talking to the board about the Medicare benchmark um, coming up in a couple of weeks and um, it really ties in well to the question that you're asking here about how those are set and how risk corridors can impact sort of that potential um, savings or losses earned at least specifically in the Medicare program. And if I can just right. add one other factor Chair Foster that that's that's worthy of consideration is when we think about the, the populations within these payer programs, so thinking like Medicare versus Medicaid versus commercial, um, very different presentation of, of social risk, social determinants of health, and other risk factors um, that they, dis, they, they have very disparate impacts on sort of how these programs come to play out. So, you know, the Medicare population is plagued by different problems than the Medicaid prop population. And so I think that that also factors into some of that variability. Wouldn't those go into how you set the target, though? Sure, that that is a big part of it. I mean, but the the targets are an imperfect animal in in that way. I mean, they 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 certainly work at a macro level, but in a micro way, when you get into any specific you know issue or problem, you know, things like that can start to break down. Okay, kind of a related question. It looked like from some of the data we saw on quality. Um, in particular, the Blue Cross, I think uh, Ms. Gilbert Davis called it um, a spider graph. You do see quality performance go up and down, and it actually kind of all goes in tandem up and down, generally speaking. I was wondering if there's any thoughts from the, yeah, this one. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. The the One Care folks, what, why is this? What What explains the fact that it goes up one year and down one year and it all kind of moves together? This is for large group. I would also um, have one care comment on QHP, which is right there. There. Yeah. Very same. Similar. Same thing. Yeah. So I, I think what I'm seeing here when I look at this is the spider effect is driven more by variation in performance across different measures than necessarily within a specific measure. So like not a ton of variation, for example, year to year within child and adolescent well care visits. But you can see that the performance, you know, for example, between child and adolescent well care visits and diabetes mellitus management, obviously very different, different results on on this this graph. So I think that's more where the spider effect comes in. Um, but if you look at the year over year performance within given measures, it tends to run relatively consistently. I agree. I think you have to really pick apart how this graph is designed to understand the ups and downs. If I, if I may, um, so for any any one point for on this graph, for example, um, if we look at child and adolescent well care visits, 
Um, the variability from one year to the next for that visit is seen by the color of the dots. Right? The, the down, the, I think this, the choice of using the spider of connecting the lines gets confusing because the performance isn't connected year to, across measures year to year. It's one, one measure multiple years. Right. So child care um, at its highest point, the gold um, color dot is 2021 or the yellow. And then the lowest, which is kind of the bronze color is 2019. So that's the year to year variability. And this gets to Professor Holmes's point earlier about statistical significance. Um, when I look at these charts, and admittedly they're hard to, to understand, but when I look at them, um, I don't see much change for any measure year over year. There's no substantial change. There's no statistical test that's been done to let us know if there's a statistical difference. Um, if the sample size is large enough, even a small difference could be statistically significant. But when I look at these dots, there's no substantial change in any of these measures. Yeah, that I'll just um, briefly add, we have marked these uh, slides in the past, not, not this slide, but for signif statistical significance, and we can go back and do that again. Um, that that's not a hard ad, and I we have seen statistically significant movement. I know I've reported that to you in the past. Um, what we haven't seen is um, sustained significant or statistically significant movement. So a measure that moves statistically one year um, up might might drop back down again the next year, or yeah. Um, so, but we can we can absolutely add that data. We. Might I think we get into pretty small num numbers on some of these, but we'll we'll mark those up for you and send them back. Yeah, if I could just add, just oh sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, it, it's we. I, I like statistics and I like statistical significance to for implication, but I think it's also just an, it's important that we think of overall meaningfulness. As a clinician, we think of what's a clinically meaningful change or the minimal clinically different score that we we need to see. And of course, this isn't this is policy, not clinical. So in addition to wanting to know if there's statistical significance, I also just need some face validity that it's substantial. And these are not substantial changes. Um, go ahead, Mr. Raines, and then I think Member Holmes had something. Yeah, one other really small point that I wanted to add to this that I think kind of adds a little bit to the variability, especially in the context uh, of statistical significance, is that these are different cohorts. So you're going to see some variability in the results from year to year, given the given that you're measuring different sets of people. So, and the provider network also changes year to year to some extent, not not greatly, but it can change. So there, there are other reasons for that variability too. And could I, Chair Foster, I know you're, you're in the middle. Um, if I could just address a point that was made a few moments ago about the difficulty of of answering questions like why so much savings in one um, area and not savings in another and the flip from year to year. Some of the responses that we heard were that, well, there's a lot of churn in the patients that are, are in the cohort that are attributed. Um, there are natural changes in factors. There are externalities. Um, and so that makes it difficult to predict what will happen. And I understand all that to be true, but the point of alternative payment models and healthcare reform writ large is to overcome those limitations, right? So that we can create policies and interventions that 
improve the healthcare experience for patients, improve outcomes that matter to patients, and are less wasteful than fee-for-service has proven to be over the last 50 years. And if we're saying that those factors don't allow what we are currently trying to do, those externalities, those natural um, changes and the churn don't allow us to predict what's happening, that in essence is saying that what we're doing is not working. Let's just be clear about that. If we can't overcome those things, then what we're trying to do is not working. Those things are always going to be there. We would need to overcome those. Um, I think I'm going to, uh, Member Holmes, you had something, and then I had, I think, just one or two more questions myself, and I see that Dr. Wolfman has her hands raised, but Jess, do you have your, okay. Um, Dr. Wolfman, yeah. did you have anything? Yes, thank you, um, Chair Foster. Just in response to what Tom just said, I agree. I think um, as a practicing clinician in primary care, we have been lax about evaluating social determinants of health. And going forward, that is a health equity and determining the social needs of Vermonters will play a bigger and bigger role, needs to play a bigger and bigger role in this work. And um, I'm happy to say that lots of people came together on October 27th to talk about this and how we can align across the state. So many of the people who are presenting today were there or representatives from the payers were there. We hope to have another meeting next on January 5th, but building this into our work is one way that we can help uh, all Vermonters get the care that they need, get access to care, in the right place at the right time uh, and get what they need to be healthier. So I think that is, is a huge factor and I'm glad to say that we are working on that. I think uh, we cannot underplay the need to align on the quality work. And in that area, we need buy-in from people who are providing the clinical care. So providers need to jump on board more than they have. And I think those are some of the factors um, why we haven't made more progress. Um, thank, thank you, Carrie. I agree with your comments there. Um, I have one small question, then one other one. Um, on the CAP surveys, I thought someone said that they we, we dropped doing the phone calls um, to do the CAP surveys. I'm just curious why, or if that, two questions, why, and then did it sort of limit the volume? Those Medicare specifically, I can't speak to whether or not one care did that for the remain the rest of their payers. They certainly could. Um, and last year we did see a decrease in response rate based on that choice, which is when it was initiated okay. for Medicare specifically. I can do some research and get back to you on that with more information. I am not sure of the answer. Okay. Um, and then the only other question I had is, I'm not as close to this as everyone else, and you guys have been doing this a lot longer, but if I'm trying to get at the causality, which I understand is massively difficult and complex, um, but should we as a regulator be looking to see the quality scores improving and if they are, should that correlate to savings? So what I'm saying is if quality's flat and we have savings in one year and not in another year, but quality's kind of flat along the whole period of time, does that sort of indicate to us um, that it might be more of a how we're calculating total cost of care issue as opposed to the interventions that we're doing or the incentives that we're that we're using? And then, you know, what? I, I should be much more skilled at asking questions, um, given that I spend most of my life doing it. So I'll try it again because that was a horrible question and no judge would ever allow it. So I'll try again. Um, but 
uh, should we expect to see quality scores move in tandem with savings? I think that's a really difficult question to answer in a general way. Um, I think generally speaking, yes, you would think that as quality scores improve, cost would also improve, but I don't know that you could necessarily draw the conclusion that the two are directly correlated all the time. Uh, Mr. Garland, did you have a thought? Yeah, thanks. I'm going to answer from more of a principled position than a, a expert position. And I, I think the answer is absolutely, uh, but quality should outpace cost. At, at the very minimum, we should be seeing the quality improvement. We should be seeing the quality improvement clearly where we are putting in effort to improve the quality. I believe that savings will be slower to come because this is a complicated financial system with so many revenue opportunities. It tends to be, I believe, a bit self-healing on the revenue side. Um, so if, if revenues fall because quality improvement leads to less costly specialty visits, revenue-driven organizations are going to manage to their revenue targets by finding those dollars somewhere else. Generally speaking, then, I think the financial um, performance is, is always going to lag a bit behind the quality metrics. But if we're not seeing the quality improvement, I don't know what financial improvement would tell us. Um, and I would be concerned about, <laughs> about that state of affairs. Um, you know, I don't think we've seen that in Vermont, but in other parts of the country during the HMO movement, um, there were certainly places where quality did not improve, got worse, but cost went way down. Um, that was not good for patients. Um, and it's not what we want here in Vermont. Right, good point. Um, a couple of hands came up, so um, I'll go Member Walsh and then Mr. Raines, and I believe Ms. Kill uh, had it. So, Member Walsh. I think you're 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 muted, Tom. Hey, thank you. Um, Andrew um, hinted at the point in the last part of his comment in the managed care era. We've, we found that it's very possible for any provider system to dramatically reduce their expenses to Medicare or to any payer just by refusing to see people or refusing to see sick patients, right? And so when ACOs started and we talked about bending the cost curve, we knew that any organization could achieve a savings if they set their mind to it by refusing to see sick patients. And so the quality measures in an ACO are there to make sure that does not happen. You have to achieve certain quality benchmarks in order to receive back the savings. They unlock the savings. If you don't achieve the quality, you don't get the savings. They're there as a check to make sure there's not undue rationing. So the fact that there, an organization could have moderate to good quality, it could be flat over time, and they achieve savings some year or they don't achieve, depending on how much um, their volume of care. But you, you've got to achieve quality benchmarks in order to unlock the savings that you get back to you. That's, that's why quality measures are there. Mr. Raines? Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, Chair Foster, that maybe part of why some of that alignment between cost reduction and quality improvement isn't so apparent is because we function in one-year programs with one-year targets. And oftentimes within a given year, quality improvement might involve increased cost. You might have to spend more to improve quality, at least initially. Um, and then another point that I would make is that you know, sometimes the investments in quality improvement don't sugar out within that program year. So, I mean, these are multi-year investments in patient health. So, I mean, things that things that improve quality over multi-year periods don't necessarily appear within the given performance year. 
So sometimes that correlation is a little difficult to draw. Um, I certainly agree with the points that were made by others, though, that that there should be a direct correlation between the two. It's just not always easy to 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 clearly identify that correlation within the confines of a one year program. Yeah, I mean, my question is more getting at the over time, it looks pretty flat 2018 to 2022, whereas the savings kind of go up and down, but the quality is relatively flat. Yeah, and I, I think that that comes um, back to sort of that that slow burn over quality versus the one year program target, which can be sort of variable um, yeah. year to year, sort of as we've covered. Okay, great. Well, th well thank you. Um, any other board member questions or comments? Oh, sorry, Miss Kill. Um, sorry, I just I put my hand down because I was like, oh, he knows. <laughs> um, so just two things that I wanted to bring up to address your question about the, the um, um, differing trends between financial performance and quality. So the ACO's model is a provider based model, um, meaning that it's um, where people are prospectively aligned based on their engagement with their provider. So and that provider doesn't necessarily have to be in Vermont um, and that provider doesn't necessarily have to be in their area um, and the way that we measure quality for and financial performance um, for some of the measures is a resident based analytic perspective so those are really two um, the they're very different, <laughs> um, and we work really hard to try to reconcile that. Um, so that's um, one thing that I wanted to bring up. And then the other piece, which is maybe just escaped me. OK, now I've forgotten it, so I guess I'll just leave it. Um, sorry, yeah, I just wanted to add that as a reminder. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. And if it comes back to you, you know, just reach out and we can talk. Um, all right, I'll turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments. Thank you. I just have one question, and thanks, Michelle, for all your work on this. If you wouldn't mind going to slide 21, this is a question for folks from DIVA. I don't know, it's a ways back. Yeah, so just on the first bullet, I was curious if folks from DIVA could talk about what they think was the cause of these you know, the difference in expected and actual um, for both the, you know, the ACO attributed members and the expanded attribution cohort. Thanks. Hi, thanks. This is Alicia. Um, I think what we've seen in the last several years is performance following a similar trajectory with um, the actual experience being uh, slightly less than the expected total cost of care for both our uh, traditionally attributed cohort and our expanded attribution cohort. Um, I think, honestly, the, the last several years, it's been a little bit difficult for us to pinpoint the, the drivers of the difference. And I think utilization patterns looking different uh, in the kind of last several pandemic and post pandemic years um, as compared to benchmark years, which were based on a, a pre pandemic level of utilization is one of the things um, that accounts for that. Um, I think that, you know, would certainly welcome input from the one care team as well. I know we we'll do some additional analysis of of some of what they're looking at within each of the pay. But since this experience was relatively Consistent with experience that we've seen in prior years, we didn't have anything additional that we had flagged as a as a driver for 2022. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'll open it up to public comment via the raise the hand function. Um, Ms. Wasserman. Yes, thank you. Um, I have uh, a number of comments on both uh, the One Care 2022 quality results 
as well as the financial results. And I'll start with the quality. Um, I'd just like to point out that the overall quality scores, um, in my view, are abysmal. After all these years, one care's quality appears to be spiraling downwards. Medicare had a score of 66%. That's the lowest ever. Medicaid, 65%, the lowest ever. MVP, 45%, the lowest ever. And Blue Cross Blue Shield basically sees no difference between uh, ACO and non-ACO lives. So, um, you know, we're talking uh, lowest, lowest ever, lower than the 2020 year of COVID, lower than the 2021 year of post-COVID. Um, so uh, it's, you know, when we say that they're um, uh, level, I, I, I don't see the level, I don't see level, I see a downward um, movement. Um, additionally, uh, in terms of a comparison between non-ACO and ACO uh, clients, patients, um, I think it's instructive to look at uh, OneCare's presentation several weeks ago uh, in their CPR program. It turns out that uh, CPR practices perform significantly fewer adult wellness visits than non-CPR practices. So uh, that was slide 32. If you care to go back and look at it, uh, this is One Care's presentation on November 8th. Um, adult annual wellness visits are, as we all know, one of those critical indicators of the kind of care that patients are receiving. And uh, so I found that uh, kind of a surprising um, uh, data point that the um, non-CPR practices actually um, perform more adult annual wellness visits than the, non than the CPR practices. Um, moving on to the um, One Cares 2022 financial results, uh, I would just like to take an overview uh, and look at it by category. So uh, in terms of losses, Blue Cross Blue Shield primary had losses, um, or I should say One Care had losses in Blue Cross Blue Shield primary, One Care had losses in MVPs, QHP. Uh, then the next category is no savings, and that um, is applicable for Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP. Uh, Medicare, in my view, the savings were meager, $490,000. But in Medicaid, the savings were uh, phenomenal, almost $12 million. Um, so my question is, if most all of the of One Cares payer programs in 2022 had pretty marginal results, pretty marginal financial results. How can we explain One Care's phenomenal Medicaid savings of almost $12 million? Physicians, as we all know, are payer blind and they treat all patients alike. That's been uh, actually mentioned a couple of times in today's hearing. So, you know, is there any way we can find out exactly what One Care did to achieve this $12 million in Medicaid savings in 2022? Um, can One Care name the interventions responsible for these savings. So, and another question is, you know, is DIVA doing due diligence in negotiating its initial contract with uh, OneCare? And I guess I'm curious about the methodology because the distinction between Medicaid savings and all the other payers is pretty dramatic. Um, by the way, the term savings is a bit of a misnomer. Um, these quote savings do not make health care more affordable and in no way do they reduce the cost of health care. Rather, it's merely a transfer of public funds to the private sector. And finally, I'd like to mention that uh, 
or recommend that the Green Mountain Care Board and AH AHS should determine a way to take savings, as we call them, and, re and use them to reduce the cost of care. How can we take savings and make health care more affordable? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, one of the questions there was pretty similar to one that I was trying to ask, but perhaps quite a bit more eloquently. And if one care had any thoughts on it, I would appreciate it on the question about the high level of 2022 Medicaid savings versus the other programs being flat ish generally. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we should contextualize that or understand that? Well, I can't answer that, obviously. Um, I would love to be able to, and I do think we should ask our CFO if he has insight about that. He would be the most expert opinion. Um, I would love to say it's due to care management, and hopefully there is a, a, a connection there. So we will um, we will look into that and see if we can answer um, with data um, and give you the truth of that. Um, I think the point about the upfront negotiation being a, fa a possible factor is is a good one. So, um, Derek, you may have Derek, you have a better answer than what I just gave. Well, I was just going to say that there's there's also some variability in the way the programs are designed. So, like for example, the entire blueprint cost is built into the Medicare target and spend. So, in as much as I understand it's built in on both sides. But that's something that doesn't exist within the Medicaid program. So that's, I mean, that's savings that's earned, that's pre-funded to the network by way of the Blueprint program. Um, so like things like that, for example, just make it really different. You know, the way that the target was set uh, with, with the commercial payer uh, for 2023 was very different from the way we set our Medicaid target versus how we set our Medicare target. So, I mean, I... I I don't mean to to refer to general things to answer a very specific question, but I, I think it's one of those devils in the details kind of things where you really have to look at the targets and the methodology separately to sort of explain the differences that go into that. Understood, right. Okay, well, th well thank you. And if you do have thoughts after you speak with um, others that you wanna share, we'd certainly be interested in hearing them. Um, um, Mr. Carpenter? Uh, Walter. Oh, hey, uh, <laughs> Walter's fine, Owen. No need for that. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm okay. How are you? Um, oh, I'm really sick right now with a virus or something. But <clears throat> speaking of that, a, a couple things. First, I want to say that I fully agree with Tom Tom Walsh's previous comments about that. I think he was the one that nailed it about what's going on with all these charts and graphs. Uh, Julie Wasserman comment about transfer of public funds to private companies is also right on, because that's what's really going on here. Um, and I wanted to ask a, and another comment is that when we talk about payers, and I reiterated this before umpteen times, like a broken record, the insurers are not the payers. We are. The insurers are the ones who distribute it. They are the middle people. We are the payers. The last comment is of improving access to health care, which I found really interesting because as a patient, for me, knowing that I have a deductible even though I'm on Medicare and some of these <clears throat> crazy supplement programs, is what prevents me from seeking medical care because I know that I'm going to get hit with an astonishing bill later on. That the access problems are caused by that deductibles, co pays. It's not by any of the other things that we've talked about here. I mean, yeah, transportation is some, but <clears throat> at bottom, the real culprit is, is that you can't afford the access because if you have a $6,000 deductible, how can you do that? Most people living paycheck to paycheck can't afford any of that. 
So when we talk about improving access, <clears throat> I'd like to hear more about what you can do or what we can do to mitigate copays deductibles and stuff like that, which are insurance companies passing costs on to us. And other than that, I kind of agree again that a lot of, with uh, Tom and with Julie about this and with some comments that Owen has made too about how flat a lot of these charts are. Thank, thank you, Walter, and I hope you feel better. Um, <sighs> I barely made it through the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you did. Um, and last but certainly not least, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a, of course, we've had a huge volume of stuff go by today. Uh, I just got two or three comments. Uh, they you can't come close to getting all of it. But uh, the first thing is that I just don't think one care Vermont really really can't control quality. It doesn't have enough power. It, the, the, the reality is the reality is that the, you already have data in your archives, okay, which is, shows that like some of the PQI data, the PAU data, um, the recommendations on what to do with small hospitals, that kind of thing. Um, the, the, what, what the, what one care is, one care I think has 31 quality measures. I mean, I might remember it's 85, but I, the, I remember it's 31. And every one, every single one of those is basically a fill in the box. And so did you give somebody a pill or did you call somebody back or that kind of stuff? The reality is that you can't, the reality is that you, that, 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 that the, the real question in quality is what's, What's the what is the 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 actual performance in the delivery of the care? And we just don't have any we just don't have many measures for that. The ones that you do have, okay, are very clear. That what they show is that the UVM uh, system is by far the best in PQI and is is just way ahead of anybody else. But this but the problem is that if that this problem this problem this quality problems everywhere, including in UVM, okay. And the, if the but you don't have any but nobody has any real power to go and go after that stuff, and so I, I just think that that I think what you're doing is that what you really need one care Vermont for is to do is to change reimbursement from fee for service to capitation, which is the secret to the whole ball, ball of yarn, um, and uh, so in it so in, in any event. The, the, the and on the question, I thought it was Mr. Chairman. I thought your ch question is good about trying to figure out why these lines are acting funny. That says that some things are going up, some things are going, some things are going down. The, if you if you want to, if the the connection between cost and quality is is obviously is obviously critical, uh, but it only runs really in it only really runs in in one direction, okay? If you improve your quality, you're gonna improve your costs, okay? But you can improve your costs without improving your quality. And the, so the question really is still out there. What, what, are you gonna, what are you gonna do about the quality of, of the system? And I just think that what you're gonna have to do is, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to go into the individual hospitals, any hospital, that gets a that gets told anything gets told anything by one care can just tell them to forget it. They don't they they don't have to do it. And the reason people are doing unnecessary care, low quality care, the reason they are is because they believe that they have to have they need the money to keep the doors open. So in any event, um, I just think that 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 you know. Uh, we, you got the, that mass of data that we saw today. I don't. Nobody's going to be able to do anything with that. You, you, you got. You can't get, do even the basics, and that's not because there's something wrong with you. Uh, there's nothing wrong with you. Okay. The problem is that the that the the uh, internal connections, the, the way the machinery is built, uh, just just doesn't yield to one care per month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Great. 
Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone. And, you know, these presentations go by fairly quickly, um, and there's a lot there, and I know the work that goes into them is massive. And so we get this really nice presentation that's here and, and easy for us to digest, but there's so much more of the work that goes on beyond it, behind it to make that happen. So I just want to recognize that and thank everyone from all the um, payers and one care and um, our team as well, Lindsay and Michelle. So thank you everyone very much. Um, is there any old business or new business to come before the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned and have a nice afternoon.